thank you very much for being here. I'll be very, very brief because I want uh, this panel, this discussion to be as rich as, as possible. Um, in the eyes of children, scientists are mainly men. Uh, indeed, only 35% uh, of students enrolled in STEM, that is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics related fields are females. And women make only 28% of scientific researchers worldwide. So we are here to discuss with some of the best experts in the world uh, why this is happening and how can we solve it. Just a couple of things. Would you, as you, as you know, you can ask some questions via app. And if you are watching this in the streaming, you can also use Twitter. We will use the hashtag science. That is over there with the SH. So please, if you have any question and seeing this in the streaming, use that uh, hashtag. So I'm going to present our uh, speakers at first. I have on my right, Paulo Speller. He is the Secretary General of the Organization of Ibero-American States for Education, Science, and Culture. Um, prior for that, he was uh, a Secretary of Higher Education in the Ministry of Education in Brazil, and also the Rector of the Federal University of Mato Grosso do Sul among an, a lot of things that I can really sum up in this, <laughs> with this little time. I have also Botina Asama. She's a science journalist by in Cairo and is responsible for commissioning and editing SciDevNet, Middle East, and North Africa News. Welcome. Um, uh, I also have Chiara, Chiara Tripepi. Uh, she, is, uh, she works as police officer in the gender section uh, and joined DG Research and Innovation in the Commission, uh, European Commission in December 2012. Welcome. Carmen Segura over there. She works at Fundación Descubre in Spain, in Andalusia. Uh, she is the coordinator of many projects that are related with science, biodiversity, and natural resources. And we also have Ruth. Ruth Onyanga. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Onyango? Is that, is that correct? <laughs> I'm sorry about that again. She is the director of Rural Outreach Africa. She's also a professor of food and nutritional science. Thank you very much. So each of one of our speakers will have a very little time, just three minutes. I'm going to be a little dictator here today. Just three minutes to explain our uh, first introduction, to try to explain what is the situation of women and, 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 and little girls in science and STEM careers, and try to, to, to very briefly give, give, me a, give us a little solution of what will they do if they had to do only one thing to try to solve these problems. So Paula first, please. Mm. Thank you. Well, good morning uh, to everyone. Uh, three minutes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's uh, get deep into the ideas of the strategy of the our organization, the OEI, uh, in science and women as a first uh, intervention, the first uh, three minute intervention that we have. And uh, the idea is uh, to say that the OEI is an organism that acts towards education at all levels and modalities in science, specifically in scientific policy frames. Uh, of course, uh, there have been uh, very positive changes in the last few years, uh, but of course the speed of change has not been uh, as fast as we would like in all countries uh, in the last few years. Uh, although there has been some positive change throughout the past years, uh, uh, we have been uh, we have had a different uh, uh, impacts in different countries, in different moments, in different uh, regions. It is necessary. This is what we have uh, concluded. It is necessary to promote vocation towards science. It is necessary, of course. And in order to achieve this, it is crucial to commence with a primary education that advocates. Uh, for uh, observation abilities and that promotes asking about the incentives teachers receive. Teachers we have to provide with resources and that we have to educate, we have to prepare and passionate towards a scientific path. Teachers at primary level are the key at this initial level. Uh, uh, this task lies on the hands of the ministers of education or, or whatever level at the regional level in each country and with uh, a help from our organization, we have been involved in different projects at different moments in different countries. 
uh, with different levels of involvement. And more important, everything has to be equal, equal for boys and girls. And we have to keep in mind this concept of equality or equity for boys and girls. There is no difference. We're talking about the primary level. Once secondary education is reached, the time comes for our youth to undertake a professional decision. That's a crucial moment. And this is a key point in which personal decisions should be encouraged and fomented. This is the time when education should be filled with innovations in the speeches, in the workbooks, in the, the methodologies deployed, and all the causalities that confirm that the capabilities of women are equal to those of men. This is the crucial man, my moment when teachers can really make a difference to that supposed equality that we have been working during the primary level school. The data that we have guarantee and uh, uh, show us that women who access higher education in the scientific fields obtain equal, not only equal, but better results than men when they reach higher education. It would be supportive if these women, especially those studying mathematics and engineering, would stop by the centers or the uh, schools uh, where they have studied their secondary education to shed a light on the fact that scientific careers for women are reachable. To get back to their secondary schools and to show, I have been studying in this school and I am at university now studying mathematics and engineering and I have done it and I am I'm doing it much better than my colleagues, my, uh, the men that are my colleagues. Only 30 seconds. No. 30 seconds. <laughs> Well, you see, we have been doing that for the last 70 years. Our organization exists for the last 70 years. And what we have been trying to do is to do and to develop those projects in almost uh, in uh, 23 different countries with different uh, priorities. And what we are doing is to develop some demonstration projects so that uh, uh, these countries can adopt them as projects that can be transformed into national policies. We don't want to replace the government to say we can do what the government should do. No. These are demonstration projects and what we are trying to show is this is feasible. We can do it. We have these demonstration projects and we have done that. In a few countries this has been possible. And especially in the case of uh, this priority of uh, uh, vocation, vocational projects involving uh, the preparation of uh, teachers at primary level, at secondary level, and uh, uh, having as a result uh, the involvement of uh, uh, girls at different levels so that they can involve themselves in careers, especially in mathematics and in engineering, whereby they can proceed in scientific and technological careers throughout their professional lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. Thank you for, for attending to the time. Rothina, please. OK. Hello, everybody. Um, actually, let me talk about where I came from, from MENA. Uh, as Patricia said, that 28% only from uh, uh, people participating in the uh, STEM field are um, women. Um, the positive thing that we have in MENA is n that numbers is saying that we have, uh, in some countries of the region, uh, as far as 40% of the uh, girls, uh, of the uh, population that is participating in STEM are women. So we don't have actually this uh, problem of uh, encouraging participating of women in, in, the, uh, in the STEM field. But where is the problem then? The problem is to keep this uh, amount of people who are participating in the field after graduation, to keep them working in this career uh, and get use of their degrees. Um, thinking of the reasons why this is not uh, happening, I think uh, the problem is somehow social responsibilities that women in our region have to take uh, when they decided to build a family and have uh, family responsibilities so and didn't have the adequate uh, support from community to uh, do both, to have a family and have a career in the same time. Uh, 
but I think this this problem have some kind of solutions because the community uh, look and the cultural look to women uh, anticipating in uh, STEM field is somehow changing these days. But the the other problem that it need a real push is uh, that there is a quite small share of opportunities women have to get uh, um, leadership um, uh, or senior positions in science. So I think the only thing that I would promote as an idea, if I have the power to enhance this gap, is um, to set a, quite a good, fair uh, uh, share of opportunities for women in senior and high jobs, higher jobs in, in science field. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Chiara, is your turn. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Chiara Tripepi. I'm a policy officer in DG, um, Director General for Research and Innovation of the European Commission. And I'm uh, working in a unit called Science with and for Society. And among the topics we deal with, uh, we have um, science education and gender equality. So what we do concretely is we develop and implement the gender equality strategy uh, for research and innovation. And we work within the European research area together with member states and research organizations. <coughs> and the role of the commission is actually to, uh, to support research organizations in bringing change within their structure. So we fund what we call the gender equality plans, uh, which are measures uh, that support organizations in bringing change and in uh, increasing the participation of women uh, in research teams and in decision making. What we've seen is, uh, as uh, you were saying two minutes ago, uh, is that we have actually, um, women are disappearing from scientific careers. So we have a sort of equality at the level of PhDs and uh, women, the more you go up the ladder of, of career, so we only have 33% of women within the researchers, 23% uh, of women as grade A professors, and 20% of head of institutions. So our strategy is really to find solutions to this uh, loss of, of women in, in scientific careers. Um, we do that, as, as I was saying, through these gender equality plans that we fund through Horizon 2020, which is uh, our framework uh, pro program for research and innovation. And yeah, so this is how we try to, to combat this loss of talent. On the other hand, we run in the past uh, a campaign to attract young girls, so not at the level of uh, university, but at the level of high school, called Science It's a Girl Thing. And it ran for three years, and the idea was really to encourage girls to, to study STEM related subjects um, through the, the use of role models and social media to really share the information better with them. Uh, the campaign is now over, but we are funding a project called Hipatia, which is also uh, involved in uh, formal and non-formal education. So <coughs> with teachers, science museums, how to better talk to girls and encourage them to, to study science. So that's Thank you, thank you, Chiara. You are our going to, uh, be, be very obedient. So, so thank you so much, Carmen. Please. Microphone. Could you hear me? Yes. <laughs> so, if I had all the power and all the money, <laughs> I wish. Okay. Um, uh, I'm a science. Uh, dissemination technician in Fundación Descubre, and I'm going to start uh, but uh, one uh, point, very important point, and it's the fact that uh, fewer uh, uh, girl, girls choose STEAM and fewer woman, uh, young women uh, choose technological careers. So, um, if I have all the power, um, like uh, Chiara said, uh, w uh, women are disappearing along uh, their scientific career. So I will uh, start it at the beginning. I will start it at the beginning. So I will do a multidisciplinary and transversal program in schools. Um, 
with the support of universities, uh, research centers, uh, science dissemination centers, media, media is <laughs> very important. And of course, and why not, we are on time. Uh, we have to take into account the feminist movement right now. We, we have the, the opportunity and, and we should um, take it in account. Um, so I think I, I finish. Yeah, I can. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, no, no. That's okay. That's yeah. okay. I can ask okay. you later. So Ruth, is your is your time. Uh, thank you so much. First of all, I want to thank uh, Kabi, uh, my organization which brought me here. I sit on their board of uh, trustees and uh, really they are science-oriented uh, organization doing research, but really turning it into practice. So what they do needs to really be applied at the very local level and uh, simplified in a way that it can be understood. And that requires a scientific mind. Uh, I support my colleagues here who have said you have to start early in schools because you have to have a love for science. Inquisitiveness, you know those of us who have children, we're now inquisitive, they are very early in life and we have to support that. But let me address the policy level. I, I've been a parliamentarian, I was shadow minister for education, science and technology and you know you come up, even where I came from, people thinking that women cannot do math and you have teachers inculcating that in children's heads, girls' heads, that you can't do math. And all of us who come from Africa, who are aware of Africa, know that even illiterate women can trade and count their money. How did that come about? Clearly, they can do mathematics. So teachers have a big role to play, but more so the governments and their policies have a big role to play. I'm told at the opening session yesterday, you had some leaders, heads of countries, who are actually pledging to support women. That's where it starts. So when the women don't want to do science subjects, they need encouragement. They need that empowerment. Yes, I can do it. So not just being good in math, being good in science, but we have to add on something else. When I visit schools, it's really letting them know that you can do it. You have to have the confidence. I can be a pilot, I can be an engineer, I can sweep also and sweep properly. I can tailor and measure properly. You know, being specific in what you do and coming up with a good product. And I believe that an international collaboration is what has helped us also in Africa, where cultures are so anti-women, so female, chauvinist. The international movement has helped us. So I'm happy to see we have a very diverse group here. I am happy to see these kinds of conference that we all need this to do this together and following the SDGs that partnerships really want. And finally, I just want to appeal that we need resources. It doesn't just happen. In Kenya, we have <laughs> had incentives for science teachers, extra, something added on. It stopped and now we have a shortage of science teachers. You can have legislation, but if you don't have resources to go with it, it becomes very difficult. So for those of you, and I've gone around the stands, who have a love for Africa, and I know you all do. You know, that's where we all came from. You all do. You have a love for Africa. That's an area you can really support, and we can work together. And I think Africa is ready to partner in a very uh, respectful way because it's good for the whole world. Yeah, so I just want to appeal that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth, and thanks, everyone, a a again. We are going to structure this debate in three blocks, okay? We are going to discuss of the problems and barriers that women face. Also, we are going to talk about science vocation, and at the end, of the, we are going to talk about role models and the importance of role models. So I want to do just to watch uh, this short video, please. Un estereotipo muy arraigado es la asociación de lo masculino al mundo de la tecnología. Este estereotipo reaparece o está inscrito en la cultura de tal manera 
que eh, en las instituciones educativas, en los medios de comunicación y en el ámbito doméstico familiar aparece como mandatos para las niñas y los niños y se refleja en el estímulo que realizan familiares, educadores al momento de eh, impulsar a las niñas a jugar ciertos juegos, a estudiar más ciertos contenidos educativos. Mientras que a los chicos muchas veces les regalamos, les ofrecemos, o incluso a veces en la escuela se les proponen juegos más de construcción, de resolver problemas, en muchos casos, y esto sobre todo se ve en los sectores más vulnerables, a las chicas les estamos ofreciendo eh, juegos de cuidado, juegos de rol, jugar a la mamá, el típico eh, jugar con muñecos, y ahí empieza un camino que después desde incluso la, la educación empieza a generar diferencias en qué tipo de profesiones en el futuro eligen los niños versus las niñas. Cuando yo fui a la escuela, hace muchos, muchos años, muchos más de lo que quiero decir, a las niñas nos enseñaban labores en tercer año, cuando teníamos nueve, y a los chicos les hacían carpintería. ¿Por qué? ¿Por qué a los chicos no se les enseña cocina? ¿Por qué no se les enseña a hacer un remiendo? Y a las chicas, otras cosas. ¿Por qué no mezclamos? Es tan sencillo como eso. So I think this, this video clarifies a lot of things. I would like, uh, like to ask uh, Paulo at first. Uh, what do you think of these problems, of these barriers, of the, 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 the role of the stereotypes? Well, we might say that uh, it is changing. It's true. Uh, in Latin America, in big cities, and there is a tendency to urbanization in Latin America, it is changing. Uh, when we go to universities in Latin America, we might say that most of the students are women. And it is true, most of our students at universities are women. More than 50%, uh, sometimes even uh, 60%, like in Uruguay, In Venezuela, 54%. In Brazil, 53%. Uh, uh, in public universities, sometimes uh, almost 60%. But when you go to specific careers uh, linked to STEM, most of uh, the students are men. If you go to engineering, if you go to physics, to mathematics, etc., you have uh, maybe 20, 20 something uh, of women studying those careers. So there is something there that uh, should be done, as, as we have been uh, 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 saying here, all of us, somehow. So what, what should be done in those cases? This is, this is the theme. And uh, I think that uh, what have we have seen here and what we, what we have been uh, discussing here is, uh, shows that little has been done in what we have been saying uh, with respect to primary and secondary school. What has to be done has to be done with respect to the education, to training, to the formation of our teachers. That's precisely where we have a lot to be done. And when we go to schools, when we go to some uh, very punctual experiences in some schools, and we have some experience which have been developed uh, not only by OEI, but by, by by community experiences, by your organizations, uh, represented here by other organizations, is that when the community takes the experiences, some experiences in Portugal, for instance, which are very interesting, some experiences in Brazil, when you have a director, when you have a, a community, when you have a, a council, uh, which is linked to the community, when the teachers are directly linked to the uh, construction of a pedagogical project in the school, You have teachers linked to sciences, to mathematics, which uh, uh, begin to construct a project which is linked not only to that uh, subject matter, but to the whole project of the school. Then you can uh, involve the students directly and then involve the girls to their vocational uh, uh, interest, to passionate the girls into their interest, into STEM. And it is possible, and those experiences show it. And this is precisely what we have to do, as I said, as we do it, as uh, punctual and isolated experience or demonstrative experiences that can uh, be uh, taken to the government uh, 
either at municipal level, regional level, or even national level, and then contribute in the sense that it can be developed as part of, uh, let's say, a national project, even as a pilot project, but why not a public policy that can be taken into consideration to be regarded as a national public policy that can be implemented uh, in the whole country. And it is possible, it is feasible, and we have been, been doing it uh, in some cases at national level. Thank you very much. A anyone wants to jump on this thing, on the stereotypes uh, role and the, the blocks? Chiara or oh, uh, Ruth? It's, it's very interesting. You know what I saw there, you know, the women being taught cooking and sewing in school, yet most chefs are men. Our best tailors of clothes are actually men, fashion designers and so on. So something goes wrong somewhere. But I want to agree with you, it's at the teacher level. Our children spend more time with the teachers than they do with ourselves as parents. And in situations where parents really are not very well educated, and maybe they can't advise, uh, for us, I think, on the continent, it's really at the teacher level uh, and with the heads of state themselves, government pushing this policy and providing incentives. And I think it can be done. We see some improvements, and sometimes we are moving forward and then we go backward. And then the role modeling, you know, having role models who go around. I did what I did because someone came to me when I was in class five and I saw what she looked like her field, and I said, that's what I'm going to be. Uh, we don't see enough of that. Role modeling is absolutely critical, and mentoring as well, and we just need to step up our game, yeah. Yes, we're going to talk about role models, uh, yeah. Sure. I'm sorry about this microphone no, <laughs> movements. <laughs> sorry about that. It's like a game. Okay, I, I would like to share with you uh, to to data, I am a, a scientist and I love data. <laughs> um, about the gender stereotypes and, and the consequences uh, in, in girls. Uh, the first one is that uh, this is terrible, but it's true. The brilliance equal men stereotype appears uh, at the age of six years old in girls. So. Is terrible, and the second one is uh, that the stereotype, uh, like uh, scientific um, and technological <coughs> careers, are not for women. Um, it uh, has a very deep root in our society. Also in Spain, for example, uh, the 63 percent. I uh, I remember yeah, the 63 percent of the Spanish people believe that women are not able to be a high-level scientist, and this is more terrible. <laughs> yeah. It is. Um, yeah. Actually, uh, back to my reason, um, as I said, the numbers are uh, telling that it's, it's really promising, but they are um, only telling half the story, because um, in my region, there's um, half of the population actually is um, uh, suffering illiteracy. So um, it's and 70% of women in my region is illiterate. So the first step actually is to bring them and to participate in primary education first, then introduce them to STEM. This is the next step. So this is a very huge challenge that um, uh, this uh, field is facing in, in my region. Um, some of the countries in my region actually is doing well, like in Jordan, for example. Women have uh, a very good opportunity for higher uh, positions. Um, in Algeria, too. Um, the problem um, in Egypt, there is a, a good uh, environment for women to pursue in, in science career. But still, there is what we call like um, glass ceiling, that you can't pass this ceiling easily if you are a woman. Um, uh, still, I think that illiteracy and cultural norms are the main challenges that we are facing in, in this field in, in our region. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. I don't know if you have. Um, no, if I may just add quickly something on stereotypes sure. and the role of teachers. 
Uh, we fund, among other projects, a, a project called Scientix, which brings together <laughs> science teachers from all over Europe. And we, had, we have established workshops on gender equality. And it was amazing to see how teachers had plenty of bias, implicit bias, and they just never thought about it. So while we were explaining them why gender equality was important, why it was import to, important to encourage girls to participate and maybe treat bo boys and girls differently in the classroom, they, their reply was that they just never thought about that. They never thought that they had a bias. They never th they thought you know, that they were just doing their job perfectly. So I think what we need to do is also tackle stereotypes, wake up people, and keep on bringing this issue up all the time. Thank you very much. So about science vocations, how, how can we enhance them? Uh, is anything that you know, maybe practical, from the practical point of view, that we can use or we can do to do that? Let's take a look to this video again. Desde pequeña, mis abuelos eran los que me cuidaban. Eh, mi abuelo siempre le ha encantado arreglar tanto refrigeradores de todo lo que se encontrara. Y yo siempre quise ayudarlo. Todo era tan bonito para mí. Algunas de mis amigas, como cuando estábamos en el colegio, decían que no se sentían como la capacidad de estudiar algo con matemáticas, con física. Porque según ellas, los hombres tienen más capacidad. ¿Por qué crees que no hay tantas mujeres desempeñándose en carreras o en trabajos de ciencia y tecnología? Uno piensa que solamente otros tipos de trabajo más femeninos en los que uno tenga más cuidado son los que uno como mujer debería optar. En el mundo de la educación uno de los elementos más importantes es el libro de texto, aunque tiene sus detractores. Por eso cuando se me pregunta por qué ¿Qué harías para fomentar vocaciones hacia la ciencia? Pienso que incorporar en libros de texto de ciencias y, por qué no, de historia también, eh, elementos en los cuales la mujer sea la protagonista de un hecho científico tecnológico es fundamental. La elaboración de los referentes, el acercar a las chicas a los referentes femeninos en distintos ámbitos, ejemplos como la red de mujeres de matemática, otra cosa que veo que, pare, que resulta bien tiene que ver con asociaciones. Las asociaciones de mujeres líderes, tanto en el ámbito de la ciencia como la ingeniería y en el ámbito empresarial, que eso también es relevante. Hoy me siento segura y confiada. Sé que puedo elegir, que soy aceptada, que me respaldan y que el futuro me traerá muchas oportunidades. Uh, some of the ideas they, they said, one is uh, having the, the, the textbooks in the, in the schools to have role models, not only in science, but in history also, of role models of women, of important women that have made uh, changes in history. Also the role of the women associations, not only associations of, of women in technology or science, also in, in uh, entrepreneurship or uh, this kind of things. And at this point, I would like to uh, uh, present you to Ernesto Hernandez, who is here with us. Ernesto Hernandez is from El Salvador. He's 26 years old only. He has mentored a group of girls for the innovation contest. So in, Ernesto, in just two minutes, can you explain to us, please, the, your experience in, in El Salvador and how did this work? My pleasure. Um, I'm actually, I'm a teacher and a professor in high school, middle school, and university. And all that you're speaking about, <laughs> I do it every day. And it's quite funny because ideas, there's a lot. And we all have good ideas. But the main issue is how to implement them. Because as you said, resources are very limited. And we need, like, we need a lot of policies to make them real. So I had the support of the school where I work. But what we did actually came from the girls. One day, I finished my, my lesson, and they just came to me, and they were like, hey, mister, can you help us? <laughs> and everything started. It's a contest was called Technovation, and it's supposed to, to create an app. A group of girls must create an app that will respond to a social problem in our countries. So they started looking around, what's the problem? And, uh, and what they noticed is that there's a lot of problems everywhere. So they... The, the hardest part for us in El Salvador was to choose the problem. But they noticed that 
<laughs> it was very hard for people who want to give blood to get in contact with organizations that can receive the blood. So they started doing this app. The first year was a lot of work, uh, speaking about databases and all technological matters. And they really loved it. And actually, even in my lessons, when I, when I make projects about STEAM technologies, it's very curious because always girls have the best grades. And they even say they don't like it. <laughs> they even say, oh, I hate this. But they always do more than I ask for. <laughs> so it's quite funny because r to this morning, a mother wrote me to me. And she programmed the Mario Bros. game. And it was amazing what she did. Maybe the problem is also that families don't support girls who want to be engineers. And it's not only about policy, it's not only about resources, it's also about motivation. And as you may know, as you may do in your lives, being a teacher and a professor is also a motivational speaker work. Yeah. We're supposed to take all these capacities and make them, br make, make them shine in the world. So this has been my experience. And what we really need is an infrastructure, a structure that helps us to make this bigger and to reach more girls. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your experience. I don't know if you want to jump on this, maybe uh, this, this role of the families or in the, the schools. Do you agree, for example, Odila? Oh, no, no, yeah. you, you. <laughs> okay, I, I, I think you are doing a great job, actually. Um, and uh, I think role models and uh, make this kind of, of um, figures influencing enough on, on small girls is, is really uh, the most effective way to help them flourish and, and um, uh, find their way in, in life. So thank you. <laughs> I, I come from Kenya, and I know I'm not here just representing Kenya, but really, Kenya started uh, very aggressively to enforce uh, free primary education, and now it's even mandatory. So chiefs will go to jail, parents will be penalized if they don't send their children to school. It, it, there, there are you know, questions about the quality and so on, but at least now it's a question of everybody must go to school. So now, what are they going to school to study? Uh, the other thing is uh, supporting science. We have science competitions. We have national exams. And girls even do better than boys. <laughs> By the way, the boys are worried now. The boy child is in danger. But like she says, in the end, and I think Paolo said also, when it comes to careers, you don't find so many women in science. We don't have incentive structure anymore. Many in medicine because they can also do family medicine and manage with bringing up a family, those who are actually married. So there's something that happens post-graduation or in choosing a career. What environment do we need to do to prepare for women so they can be incentivized to take on a career that is science-oriented, but at the same time fulfill their family and societal responsibilities. And I think that's where we can share ideas on how that can be done. But right now, I think Kenya right now, we can have women pursuing anything. You know, it, it, the men are worried, you know, they can do math. And I'm a professor like you, I love to speak. I enjoy it and they, they, women are really challenging the men. And we are not saying we want to take over, you know, I tell them, we don't want to take over from those men. But we have to have the confidence to show that we can also do it without uh, really uh, um, jeopardizing our femininity. Yeah, we can actually do it. So that's where we are headed now. And I think it's a, a good story for all of us to share and, and see how we can move forward. Sure, may, may I just add one little thing? I think um, we need to you know, change culture, shift culture. So we need to empower women, but also to empower men. I mm -hmm. think it's not only about women, women, women. Because if men, men are also have a responsibility in that. So we need to share this, let's say, burden. I don't know how to call it, but let's share and act together. I mean, a woman can have a career even if she has kids because the men can take care of the kids. Yeah. 
the way the women are now taking care of the kids for the men to have their careers. So I think really we have to change culture and work together and share this responsibility. I can just, just quickly sorry. that, yeah, these changes in Kenya have happened with the support of men. <laughs> I mean, men are not just sitting there. In fact, when you don't involve them, they become a real, a, a real pain in the neck to the women. <laughs> so it's something that you have to, it, it is not something you write down and this is how you will do it. It just begins to evolve organically. And now we hear men, and we have a constitution which is very woman friendly. So when you don't have enough women at this table, for example, we, have, we must have at least one third of either gender. So it will be the men, if we have men only, it will be the men who will be saying, oh, where are the women on that table? So it sort of just happens organically, and it all depends on how the culture is accepting it, and when they are resistant too much, you stop and look back and just make sure you are moving forward as a, a whole culture and as a whole community. Mm. Um, can I just add sure. one thing? Um, talking about um, uh, how, how uh, governments thought about uh, enhancing this gap uh, too much and want to show that, that they might somehow do it in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. So for example, we covered a story a few years ago about Jordan and their first uh, fu uh, fund that is dedicated to post uh, uh, female researchers and they didn't have a single participant for this fund. And the problem was that it was um, uh, uh, a bit low uh, uh, sub fund that is, uh, with a small amount of grant. So uh, the girls actually went to the larger one with competing with, with men in the same grant instead of going to the um, grant that is dedicated for them. So it's, it's, it's problematic that somehow governments in, uh, and institutes in developing world uh, sometimes want to show that they, need to, they, they are caring, but in a wrong way that is not applicable enough for, for or a real solution for, for uh, women. Okay, uh, I just want to remind you that you can, you can ask questions via app, although we are going to have uh, uh, afterwards a, a debate, but you can ask your questions are also on Twitter for the people that is going uh, the scene on the, on the streaming of SciDev, uh, you can ask your questions. So um, next block, the role models. We have talked a little bit about how important they are. We're going to see another video about this. Que las niñas y las jóvenes tengan modelos de mujeres científicas es muy importante. Es quizá una de las cosas más importantes para animar las vocaciones de, de científicas en las jóvenes. Cuando uno piensa en científicos, eh, difícilmente encuentre demasiadas mujeres. Quizá si se hiciera de manera deliberada una historia de la ciencia y una historia de la tecnología resaltando el papel de las mujeres y eso se contara, y se contaran las historias de las mujeres iberoamericanas científicas, entonces eso empezaría a generar una suerte de imaginación de que nosotras también podemos. I'd like to highlight the, the, the role uh, that they really play every day in the communities, the young women in the rural communities and also the old ones because they are, they are the ones that they are invisible and they are really working for empowering all women in their communities. They are really doing a great job that uh, they are facing all the challenges and discrimination that uh, women normally face in the community. Científicas modelos en Iberoamérica, eh, las más importantes en este sentido, pues Margarita Salas o María Blasco, por ejemplo. Eh, y es muy importante conocerlas, porque les da a las niñas y a las jóvenes una idea de hasta dónde pueden llegar. Pero lo que tenemos que evitar también es, es, es intentar que estas eh, mujeres eh, no aparezcan como excepcionales, ¿no? Como, como modelos inalcanzables, sino que eh, las niñas también las, las tengan como referentes cercanos. So, uh... Paolo, you have some experience in that case, right? Could you explain a little bit? Yeah. Actually, we developed a project which was called uh, Inspiring Women. And uh, that was in 2014. It was uh, coordinated by a professor teacher 
from a public school in the outskirts of Brasilia, which is the capital city of Brazil, in a <coughs> poor neighborhood in, uh, outside uh, Brasilia. And uh, the idea was uh, a project to enhance the self-esteem of students. Because they thought, especially the girls, because they, they thought that they had no future, there was nothing they could do about, they are too poor, they had no uh, career to think about. And uh, Gina started with uh, the idea of uh, uh, developing a project where they could uh, write about uh, their aspiring uh, uh, models. No? Uh, and uh, they started with uh, inspiring uh, women in their lives. So they thought about, uh, or they wrote about uh, their mothers, their uh, teachers, their uh, neighbors, some community figure. And that was the beginning. And uh, after that, they developed the project. And uh, little by little, the project uh, grew up and they started to wrote to, uh, about uh, other figures beyond that. Uh, little community of family and the school and suddenly they were writing about uh, all the figures that they could find in the library in the TV uh, don't, so they could include uh, entrepreneurs, women of course, always women uh, scientists uh, engineers looking for other figures and all of a sudden they're uh, they're uh, uh, environment grew up, and they could think about uh, something else beyond, because they 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 realized that there was much more beyond their poor community that they could think about, and that inspired Gina for a project that we have uh, put uh, in Brazil first, and then in all the Latin American and uh, Ibero American countries, we put up a prize for uh, a prize on uh, human rights uh, for projects developed in schools. And Gina presented this project. And the project finally won <coughs> an Ibero-American prize. And it, it inspired several projects in different Latin American countries. So the project is now spread out in different countries, in different uh, poor neighborhoods, in different schools all around Latin America because it's incredible because we're talking about a very, very simple idea, a very inexpensive idea. We don't need any sophisticated technology, anything else. And again, we're talking about educating and preparing teachers and uh, women. Again, we're talking about women because we're talking about women teachers who can do that, who should do that, and going much beyond the more immediate uh, uh, environment of the school, of the neighborhood, or where these girls are, the, these poor uh, neighborhoods, and uh, a very simple idea. And so these are the inspiring models, the inspiring uh, roles that uh, are in their vicinity and suddenly much beyond their, uh, their neighborhoods that can inspire them and open up their world of possibilities and all of a sudden, even STEM uh, vocations, no? A very, very simple idea that can be developed <coughs> easily. Easily, of course, we have to work on it. <laughs> it's not something that you just develop from today to Monday. You have to work on it, no? But it's a feasible project, again. Um, Carmen, I would like you to, to jump on this also, because I know you have some experience yeah. on that. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, from Fundación Descubre, we have a, a lot of um, inspiring um, activities, but uh, I'm going to present you uh, a material, uh, an educational material, uh, which is used uh, also uh, in Ibero-American state by OEI. It's called uh, Someone to Look Up To in Spanish for Spanish people. Or, uh, Un espejo en el que mirarte, is called. Um, the background, uh, this project was developed uh, in Atarfe. Atarfe is a small city in, in Andalusia. 
by a very active uh, community of teachers. Uh, we are talking again <laughs> about teachers uh, who, wo uh, who work with project-based uh, learning. Um, someone to look up to is composed of letters um, from female research around the world. They uh, first wrote a, a letter for invite uh, female researchers, and uh, uh, 67, I think 67 uh, scientists um, answer the, the, the letter. And it's a beautiful and nice uh, project because I, I know that uh, not everybody have, uh, has the, the opportunity to, to have role models around and near in their families and their school. And it's a digital project. So I have some examples to, if you want to see. Then um, I, I think it's nice. And one thing I, I will say more is that uh, from our experience, we do uh, science dissemination activities, uh, science fair, the European Research Night, uh, exhibition. But um, we have uh, one thing uh, very clear is uh, the fact that uh, for motivating girls is very important that girls uh, has, have the direct contact with science, uh, hands-on uh, experience, and with role models helping and supporting their, their practical experience. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to jump directly to the, to the, to the questions, uh, but first, uh, uh, before opening it to the, to the floor, I would like to ask you one question that, that came uh, via app. Uh, what negative aspects would you highlight about the consequences of lower participation of women in the STEM careers? Does anyone want to answer that? What is the problem that we are having with, the, with having less women in STEM careers? I can stand. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they are not. I mean, we are no, having less no, women. Yes, but yes. What, what, are the, what are the consequences of there that? are consequences. We are losing the 50% of the <laughs> population <laughs> and the capacity and the point of view of women. So for me, that's enough. <laughs> yes. sure. Losing this uh, amount of, of people who have brains and can... Um, uh, serve the humanity um, is is problematic because you are you are missing a lot of sources that you have and you are not using it. So this is a problem. <laughs> it's quite simple. I don't know if you have any question uh, from the. Oh my God, there are plenty of them. That's fantastic. So uh, I don't know where the microphone is. Okay. So yeah, uh, we can begin maybe there. Okay, uh, I would like to ask about El Salvador uh, example about girls developing apps to solve social uh, problems. Why not for profit? Why not for just because they like it? I mean, I think it, it still goes with the stereotypes that we women have to solve the social problems and we are focusing on science. Why not just because they like it? Just, I, I would like to, to go in depth in that idea. Okay, about that, as I said, we have very limited resources. Uh, I've tried in so many ways to have resources to be like that, because at the university I'm a teacher for an entrepreneurial mindset. So I always try to get profit from, from things. And currently it was impossible, because the government is not giving funds to create technology for girls. And other organizations, maybe they're so focused in their own programs, who are tackling poverty instead of technology. But I think that going through technology, you're tackling poverty. So it's, it's a shame right now, but maybe in a while we, we're going to be able to have funds to, to work. Um, just to, uh, I mean, I think it's what you're asking is actually very interesting and relevant. Um, the data we have says that we only have about 30% of women entrepreneurs across Europe, for example. 
Um, but we have launched a prize five years ago for uh, Europe's most innovative women. And you would be amazed to see the, 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 the results that those women are, are producing in terms of uh, turnover, uh, ideas. So it's something to which we should pay much more attention and dedicate policies as well. Because it's true that why women should work for free, why women should, you know, solve societal issues just for the fun of it without any getting anything back. But yeah. Just a brief comment. <coughs> Ernesto reminds me of a teacher which I have seen on a film. He's called the Merli. Maybe you have seen him on Netflix. I don't want to make a commercial here, but <laughs> <laughs> and um, but Merli works on a school. Maybe it's uh, your case where they work uh, on an integrative way. So there are no not these compartments of different subject matters. So if you have a health problem or a, I'd say a health uh, subject or a health uh, something or you have a, let's put it, a, something related to water, for instance, which might be a health uh, problem or uh, anything, you can work the, on an integrative way, which it has to do with uh, biology, uh, language, uh, mathematics, uh, uh, geography, anything you want. And you can, uh, you can uh, stimulate uh, STEM vocations, uh, language vocations, mathematical vocations, etc., etc., etc. And you have to have, of course, the preparation of the teachers. It's not just something that you can put on school. And Merle Walker, he was a teacher of philosophy. And he could do that. Sometimes he went out of the school, sometimes he went into the kitchen of the school, sometimes he went into the patio, sometimes he went anywhere to teach philosophy. And this uh, occasionally stimulated the teachers on the school. It was a secondary school, an instituto. So this is something that in your case, I think it applies very well. And on the, the subject that was posed before as well, because then you can, uh, it's not a matter of saying, how can we stimulate the, the, the girls on the school? Maybe working on an integrative way from putting uh, integrative subjects, then you stimulate girls and boys alike. But again, it's, it's a matter for the teacher, man or woman, to be very attentive to girls and boys, of course, to see where are the interests of the girls, or where are not the interests, the disinterest, to pick up those girls and boys to bring them to the subject. It's not easy. Those of us who have worked on schools and with schools and with teachers, we know it's not a very easy thing, no? But it's possible. It's feasible. It's something that you can plan, you can work on it. Um, hello, I'm Stella. Um, I understood the role of role models actually in this transformation. And um, on, on the field, I'm an entrepreneur, I see a lot of women who have a lot of beautiful things to show, but I think that they are not aware of the fact that they can stand up as role models and they're not aware of the impact that they can have on people in order to stand up and to shout their, their beautifulness. And I wanted to know, are there any initiatives which exist in order to encourage the role models who are invisible for the moment to stand up and to shout so that they can have, know the impact they can have? Because a lot of them want to have impact, but I think they don't know to which extent they can really change things. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone that can help? Yeah. Um, actually, in, inside of NET, we are trying to play a role in this aspect. Um, uh, we started this year um, uh, a specific section for role models, and we cover um, them from all over the developing world, uh, from the different regions that we cover. So I think we need this kind of, of um, uh, role models to give them more exposure 
to uh, women to enhance, to be in, uh, an uh, inspirational source for them. Just like Sophia, just like you say, a very important uh, comment. There are many women who have something to show, but they don't know they can show it. So even potential role models need to be role modeled. And I belong to a number of organizations where you really volunteer to be a role model, mentoring the two so sort of very close to each other. But it has to be done deliberately, and you have to have a program for it. So, but it's absolutely critical. We have to do it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I strongly agree with Ruth, and absolutely. And uh, one thing more is, uh, I think that we we should present role models as normal people who do an extraordinary job, but normal people, at least. <laughs> no yeah. Okay, any more questions? Maybe, okay, Sarah? Uh, oh, uh, yes, yeah, she, she was. Yes, uh, Hello, my name is Jivka and I am coming from Bulgaria. I have uh, rather a comment and not a question. I think it's so important what we are talking here. It's not enough one hour to, do, to discuss all this. But as we are working on a project which is exactly on the topic that we are discussing, I'm thrilled to tell you something. We don't know ourselves. We don't know us at all what women have done. I'm standing here in the stand number 12 with a game asking what women have done. I didn't have even one single answer of my questions. So there are so many women that have been such one, that have been doing such wonderful things. And what we have done in schools, we, we need to to support the teachers because they don't know how to do. It is not enough just to have uh, equality between boys and girls. We need somehow to, somehow to cultivate the esteem of boys to girls and how to do it, to teach them what women have done. So we have developed a kind of guidebook how to teach in all subject matters what women have done throughout the program. Just when you have a, a, a subject where you can show what a woman has done, show it to, to, the, to the students. And uh, slowly but uh, very steadily, they, they learn that women have done a lot of things. Among others, women have uh, invented the dishwasher, women have invented the windshield wipe, wipers, women have in invented the Wi-Fi technology, but nobody knows it. I have here the cards. Somebody, f somebody comes to the boot number 12, okay. please try the game. Nobody knows, no. nobody yes. out of us, and we are all no. women activists, and we pretend that we know a lot. <laughs> I'm an engineer. I don't know half of what is in my cards. I found it out during my research to do this guidebook. So look first at ourselves and build our, uh, build our knowledge and teach our young girls and boys what women have done during the history. Not only in history, in physics, in astronomy, in chemistry, in biology. There are so many brilliant examples. Show them to them. Thank you so much. That was enlightening. Uh, I think there was more questions or over there. I have a question. Um, I'm Gabi Lombardo, the director of the European Alliance of Social Science Humanities. And I would like to go back to the career in science. Um, and go back to a comment that was made before. As far as I'm aware of the statistics, the men and women get to a PhD level and postdoc um, equally standard, 50-50, 40-60, something around that a figure. What is worrying is the professorship, which has gone 90, 9 to 1. So something obviously goes wrong in mid-career. And I think this is an issue about entrepreneurs, it's an issue about science, it's an issue across a number of different sectors. And I was wondering if you do have any case studies, or something, because it, you mentioned exactly the same. 50-50, doctor, we go going fine. So education is no longer that much of an issue. It's not in Europe, it's not in Maghreb, it's not in some other areas which I'm looking globally. 
<laughs> the problem is the mid-career stage. So beyond the usual balance of life, of life work balance, of which we know there are lots of policies in places. As a matter of culture, you have a case studies. Can we pin now to a couple very good points? As far as uh, like yeah, the European Commission is concerned, we have th the data are like yeah, 47, 33, 23, 20. That's the, the pyramid. Um, so that's why we're funding what I was talking about before, the gender equality plans, to change the structures of the universities so, and research organizations. And we have um, a toolkit called Gear Tool. So gender equality in academia and research organizations. And there you can find a lot of examples from uh, mainly European research organizations that have implemented um, measures. So for example, there is the University of, in Lithuania, I can pronounce the name, sorry. And they had no women, for example, standing on their uh, board and uh, in the council of the universities. And then they just started to implement some measures. So they started um, engaging with um, women professors, inviting them, uh, raising awareness. And at the next elections, they had 33% of women in the board. So th there are examples of you know, small practices that change, um, that, that bring change in the life of, of a research organization. Um, but it's, it's all about the structures, actually. So we need to change the structures. Then they need to change from within. Any other question? We have five minutes left over there. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Steve. I'm in, uh, work in the education team in DEVCO, uh, EU. <coughs> I'd like to ask the panel what their sort of knowledge, experience, or evidence is in relation to scaling up the, some of the initiatives that you described or other similar initiatives in two senses. One in the sense of uh, having an impact on uh, national policies and practices across the education system. Um, and secondly, in terms of broadening uh, the focus to try and challenge gender stereotypes across all subject matters. Well, there is a, a nice project uh, we have been involved in, uh, Lights to Learn. It's a project uh, through which we have, uh, we have uh, developed uh, uh, in 13 uh, Latin American countries uh, the idea of lab, uh, taking uh, solar energy to faraway schools. I think uh, we took it in El Salvador as well and in some Central American and South American countries. Uh, in the hills, uh, in, in the jungle, uh, very far away schools which uh, had no electricity at all. Then we implemented and we took uh, solar energy to those schools and we, we took uh, internet as well to those schools. And as a consequence, uh, we provided uh, some uh, programs of uh, teacher education for the teachers in those schools and the access to information. Actually, there is a, pro there is a, a small film, a 30 minutes uh, film that is, which is available right now at our website. You can see it. Uh, Bienvenidos, welcome. It was a very nice film. It's a really nice film, which was awarded many prizes. And uh, it, is a, it is the case uh, whereby uh, at least two countries, uh, which were Uruguay and Panama, uh, which have uh, decided to implement uh, national or at least uh, broad uh, regional policies. The case of Uruguay is more uh, comprehensive because they have decided to implement the project all over the country in those schools which uh, were not electrified at that moment so that all schools in Uruguay right now are electrified and the ones that were not electrified at the moment uh, were electrified through solar energy through our project. So uh, based on some uh, pilot projects that we have developed, 
they decided to implement a national policy and uh, they have electrified the, the whole uh, system in the country. And in the case of Panama, uh, I was there when the two uh, pilot projects were implemented. I was there with the Minister of Education and she was so enthusiastic about it and in the schools, the teachers and, and the, the students at schools were, which were far away in the jungle, they were so enthusiastic and demanding the minister to have more and more, more uh, speed and more access and so on and so forth. And afterwards, she, she decided to implement a project which gradually would uh, implement uh, the project in all the schools of the country which were not electrified. And she demanded us to be involved in the implementation of the project. Of course, in other, in other countries, we are also involved, but only partially. There are countries such as Colombia and Peru, for instance, where it is much more difficult because there are thousands of schools. These are larger countries where there are thousands of schools and there are thousands of schools which are not yet uh, electrified, so it is, it is much more complica complicated and much more expensive. But this is a very good example because it is a very successful project which shows very clear that it is feasible. It, it is not a very, very, let's say, it's a very costly project because you have to implement a costly, uh, sometimes, uh, technology. But we have been able to, to have the participation of some uh, uh, energy uh, enterprise, in this case, both at national level and, and at international level, so that the costs were lowered substantially in, in most of the cases, no? such as in the case of Uruguay, <coughs> where both the national uh, uh, state uh, company was involved, as well as uh, an international company as well. And in other countries, uh, somehow, it was the same model. So maybe this is an example. There are other examples, but I think this is an interesting one because uh, some 13 countries were involved in this case. So um, thank you, Paulo. We have to, to finish. I have one, just one question came in from up, and I'm going to put Kiara in a problem because the question is to Kiara. I would like to know how the U.S. is going to take advantage of the feminist, feminist movement that is happening right now all over the world. So you have to talk <laughs> about okay. so I, I, the name of the European Union. Yeah, uh, so actually I have, uh, well, it's not that I have no idea, but we are actually listening to the different stakeholders. Um, so probably those, the feminist movement will somehow influence the parliament. I mean, you know, the European Union is a complex uh, thing, thing <laughs> but we all work together somehow. So the voices will be heard and the voices will be integrated in the policies that we are developing. But just to underline something, I mean, gender equality is a, is a key value of the European Union. So it is already, it's enshrined in the, in the treaties. Um, we have a strategic engagement for gender equality. So it is there. It's in everything we do. It's just maybe we need to put a bit, a bit more, um, not efforts, but it needs to be strengthened uh, not only at the EU level, but also at the member state level and at organization level. So it's, yeah. Okay, so thank you so much. I will uh, end summing up some of the ideas that came, came up here. Um, our panelists said that we had to begin at the schools with the families, so that are a big problem sometimes, and also with the teachers that sometimes they have biases in, in their minds and we have to help them. Also, we have to work with self-esteem, well, little girls and, and, and women also incorporating innovative methods in our, in our uh, schools. And we have also a problem in the careers because at some point women disappear from the scientific career so you have we have to study uh, what to do in the senior in the senior stage of their careers we have to work at a, at a policy level have more resources more infrastructures also have role models and a place they can stand up and shout that they are role models and of course we have to empower men because uh, we need men to, to and, and, and the little boys also to do this kind of changes and I will and with a, with a, with a, something that Paolo said, this is feasible, we can do it. So thank you so much, everyone, to, for being here. And I hope you enjoyed this panel. Thank you so much. <laughs>